Okay, now that we have thoroughly immersed ourselves in stocks and spent some time dealing with bonds, it's time to talk about the best of both worlds and the worst of both worlds. And we're talking about hybrid securities, preferred stock, convertible preferred stock, convertible bonds. They have characteristics of both. And the reality is, I'm not a big fan of these, uh, not because they might not be good for you, but it's just if you want growth and income, you buy stocks. And if you want income, you buy bonds. Why complicate things? But there are people who do um, uh, specialize in preferred stock and convertible bonds and convertible preferred stock. But we're going to find that they're really not that exciting, and in the case of preferred stock, they really aren't us for us uh, retail investors. Now you're overworked. It's you know we're getting towards the mid, the end of the semester. We're, we're not there yet, but feels like it. How am I going to make it for the next several weeks? If this doesn't interest you, or you don't have the time, forget it. Skip over it. There's only going to be three questions on exam number four about preferred stock and convertible bonds and convertible preferred stock. And I'm going to give you the questions, okay? <laughs> so uh, if you don't have time to study this, fine. Now, if you're thinking about getting into the industry, you're going to take the Series 7, you, it's the SIE, Securities Industry is Essential. Yeah, you're going to have to learn about these things, okay? But really, it, it it's not that hard. In fact, the assignment for this chapter is the easiest five points all semester long. So you should at least do that. Let's get started. How about that for, for an exposition, right? Makes you really excited about these things, right? What are preferred stock? What are these? Well, doesn't that sound like something you want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want. I don't want common stock. Ugh, I want, pre no, actually you don't. And we're going to see why. These are stocks that have a prior claim ahead of common stocks on the income and assets of the issuing firm. They're called hybrid securities, fixed income stocks. Preferred stocks pay a fixed dividend. Uh, usually as it's, it's, it's talked about by of a percentage of par. It's spoken of a percentage of par. They're gonna pay $7 a year, 7% of par value, which is $100. It's, remember, it's a meaningless number for stocks. It's an important number for bonds. In much the same way as a bond pays a fixed interest amount. But preferred stocks are equity. They're not bonds. They don't count as debt on the corporate balance sheet. And they exist in between bonds and stocks. In the case of corporate default, preferred stocks have priority over common stockholders, but are subordinate to bonds. So, so think about it. First, you got the bond. Well, first, you have to pay the employees. Payroll, payroll, and any taxes that are owed, which is usually they're not in taxes owed if the company's gone through bankruptcy. Okay, so pay you for, after the after the employees are paid, they're, they're bonds, then preferred stock. That's why it's called preferred because it's ahead of common stock, and then common stockholders. Make sense? Okay. What are the advantages? Well, typically, kind of like a bond, they have a highly predictable income stream, and so they have an excellent record of meeting dividend payments. But here's the big advantage, which is not an advantage for us retail investors. There are tax benefits if it's owned by another corporation. So who buys these things? Other companies, like Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. Remember we said Warren Buffett swooped in? and bought $5 billion worth of Goldman Sachs and $5 billion worth of GE and $10 billion worth of Bank of America when the uh, global financial crisis occurred, he bought preferred stock that paid a set dividend before any other dividends could be paid to any other shareholders. And they had to pay him a prepayment penalty to buy the darn things back. Yeah, Mr. Buffett comes across as a grand fatherly figure who will give you really good advice. He's a shark! <laughs> he didn't get to be where he was by being grandpa. What are the disadvantages? Well, uh, they're susceptible to inflation, like bonds, but they the dividends can be suspended or postponed, like stocks, unlike bonds. 
See, the best of both worlds, the worst of both worlds. There's a lack of potential substantial capital gains, unlike common stock and like bonds. And they don't pay as well as bonds, but the yield is fairly close to bonds over time. So you see they have the advantages of bonds and stocks and the disadvantages of bonds and stocks. Why not just buy bonds and stocks? That's my, that's my belief. But you remember there's some people like chocolate, vanilla, and this is pistachio. <laughs> so what's the yield? The dividend yield of preferred stock is the annual in dividend income divided by the stock price, much the same as the current yield or the yield on common stock. So you take the annual dividend income and you divide it by the current market price. This should look very familiar. And notice we'd like to see at least two decimals to the right of the decimal point. Okay, so if this stock is paying us $2 a year and the market price is currently $27.50, the dividend yield would be $2 divided by $27.50. Piece of cake. You know this already. Now, what are the pricing? Well, we use the, um, basically the, uh, the uh, zero growth model. That's basically what we're using. As with bonds, the price prices fluctuate mostly inversely to interest rates. Although there is a greater risk of non-payment of dividends, remember that dividends are not mandatory. Interest payments from bonds are mandatory, unlike bonds where the bond issuer is in default if the interest is not paid. So you take the dividend income and divide it by the prevailing interest rates. So you're getting $2.50 and interest rates are 12%. I should change that. We shouldn't use 12. How about 2%? Then the price would be $2.50 divided by 0.12, and you get 20 bucks and 83 cents. That would, is what you would expect to pay for the bond, given the current interest rates. It's a zero growth model, by the way. What's the conversion feature? Well, some preferred stock are convertible. Convertible preferred stocks, convertibles. This allows the holder of a preferred stock to convert the company's, the, the, the specified number of shares to the issuing company's common stock. So, so see, preferred stock typically doesn't participate in the growth of the company and the success of the company. So here's an example where they could, usually they never do, depends on what the conversion price is, as we'll see when we get to convertibles. But if the company did really, really well and the common stock price skyrocketed, you could possibly, you don't have to, you have the option of converting your convertible preferred stock into common stock. Some preferred are adjustable, floating rate preferred, sometimes called floaters. Dividends are adjusted periodically in line with prevailing interest rates. It's often tied to a treasury rate or some other index. They're called Floaters, floating rate preferred. There aren't that many of them. There aren't that many preferred stock to begin with. <laughs> now, uh, remember we talked about senior bonds and junior bonds. Well, the same thing happens here. There are senior preferred and junior preferred, where it's sometimes called uh, prior preferred. They, they, they issue different classes of preferred stock, just as we issue different classes of bond, different classes of stock and different bonds, senior and junior and the like. Now here's something that's important that I, we're, we're going to ask you about it, but it, you're going to have to know it if you're going to take the Series 7. And that's the idea of cumulative preferred versus non-cumulative preferred. Preferred dividends are not mandatory, just like common dividends, and can be skipped because it's a stock, it's not a bond. However, if the preferred stock is cumulative, then if the company stops paying dividends, for whatever reason, those dividends are said to be in arrears, which is a fancy way of saying, you still owe me those dividends. If you ever start paying dividends, you have to pay me the ones that you did not pay me two years ago or three years ago. So the in arrears dividends must be paid before any other dividends can be paid. So they can't turn around and pay the common stockholders until they've, uh, pay the in arrears, the, the prior years or the prior two years or however many years they didn't pay you 
your preferred dividends. And obviously, cumulative preferred is more desirable for investors, especially those who are looking for in in income, right? Because that's why they're buying them. So if the income is skipped, okay, I'm remembering, I'm remembering. If you ever start paying dividends again, you still have to pay me the dividends you didn't pay me. Make sense? I think so. I think it's pretty straightforward. Now, similar to bonds, there's some callable and non-callable preferred. So if interest rates fall, the bond, I'm sorry, the preferred stock issuer might want to refinance. And so they can call the um, the uh, preferred stock away. Similarly to, they can call a bond away. A participating preferred is a rare form of preferred that allows investors to participate in earnings beyond the stated dividend rate. So here's a little bit of a kicker, a little bit of a sweetener, because that's what happens in common stocks, right? As common stocks, as the company prospers, the common stock basically, I mean, usually, the, the company will start raising the dividend, but not with preferred. <laughs> so here's one of those rare preferred stock called participating. So we went through that pretty quickly, right? Yes, because it's not that important. But I'm, you know, in my years, I've only met two investors who actually use these things. One guy didn't even like them. He just said, I don't know. <laughs> this was in the 1980s. And then another gentleman, wasn't my client, but another gentleman used them extensively. What he would do, he was quite wealthy, he would take a, tongue, a, a tongue, chunk of money and buy the preferred stock right before the ex-dividend date. So he'd get the dividend. And then afterwards, he would sell it. And he would do that to generate. And then, of course, he'd do it again. He'd, he'd follow these preferred stocks and buy them just for the dividend, turn around and sell them. I thought that was a little much. I thought that's a lot of work for you. Know, but hey, it, it worked for him. But that was the only two people I know who actually um, like these things. And my mentor, who I got my start with uh, as a programmer, he didn't like them. He called them bonds. Huh? But the preferred stuff, ah, they're like bonds. Ah, stay away from them. He didn't, he didn't like them at all. <laughs> he, he referred to them as bonds. They're not bonds. They are technically equity. They're technically stocks, but they're not as desirable as common stocks, in my humble opinion. You decide. Okay, now, convertible securities. The reason we use the term convertible securities is because there are convertible preferred stock and there are convertible bonds. These are fixed income obligations that can be converted into specified numbers of shares of the issuing company's common stock. So we could have convertible bonds or we can have convertible preferred stock. You'll sometimes hear the term deferred equity. Why? Because these guys could be converted into the common stock, could be converted into common stock, but th th you're not, an, un, not under any obligation to do so. You don't have to. You can hang on to the bond, or you can hang on to the, uh, to the uh, com preferred stock. You don't have to convert it. It's sometimes called a sweetener or an equity kicker. So, you, so if the common stock did really, really well, you could turn around and convert your bond or convert your preferred stock. But once you've done that, there's no going back. You, you, once you've converted, that's it. Now you have your common stock. And if the stock tanks, oh, well, the, you know, that's what you own. So here's a $1,000 bond that we can convert into 20 shares or 30 shares. That's the, convert, that's the uh, we'll, we'll discuss that, the, tech, the, uh, the terms in just a moment. Okay, so what are the conditions? There's a conversion period. That's a time period during which the convertible issue can be converted. This normally deferred for a period of years uh, just so that it takes a while for, for the uh, equity to ever get uh, diluted. Because obviously when this happens, it dilutes the common stock. So they say, okay, wait a few years before we can do this. There's the conversion ratio. That's what we just talked about. They're going to tell you, okay, one bond can be converted into, can be converted into 20 shares or 50 shares or whatever. And then there's the conversion ratio. Price. That's the price per share at which the common stock will be delivered to the investor. So you take the par value and divide it by the conversion value. So it's a thousand dollar bond, and you, they were going to give you 20 shares for every uh, one bond you have. Your conversion price would be 50 bucks. So think about it. When you buy the bond, it's 
the stock price isn't going to be anywhere near the 50 bucks. The stock price has to get above $50 before it makes any sense for you to actually do the conversion. Right. They're not going to, they're not going to sell you a thousand dollar bond that can be converted into 20 shares if the price were a hundred dollars. It just, they wouldn't do it. Right. Uh, so what's the conversion value? Well, that's an indication of what a convertible issue would trade for if it were priced to sell on the basis of its stock value. And that's equal to the conversion value. I mean, the conversion value is equal to the ratio times the market price. So if we had that bond that were, we could convert to 20 shares and the stock price actually hit 60, then our bond would easily sell for $1,200, right? Because instantly anybody could take that $1,000 bond and turn it into $1,200. They could grab 60 shares, I'm sorry, $20 a share at $60 or $1,200. However, what's gonna happen? The bond's gonna sell for more, right? The convertible bond will probably sell for more than 1,200 because of the ability to convert to the stock, plus remember, the, it's a bond. It's it's generating income on its own. It's it's generating interest income. So it has a as a, a value just because it's a bond too. So there's going to be some kind of premium, and that's exactly what we call it: <laughs> the conversion premium. It's the amount by which the market price of a convertible security exceeds its conversion value, and that's a very simple calculation. The conversion premium is equal to market price minus the conversion value. So whatever above the conversion value it is selling, that's the premium. So if we have that 8% bond, $1,000 par value, and the conversion ratio is 20, so we're gonna get 20 shares. If the stock were trading at 60 bucks, the conversion value would be 20 shares times $60 or 1,200. But the bond is selling for $1,400. See, so the bondholders are saying, well, you know, I'm going to sell for $1,200. And not only can you convert it to a stock, but it's also a bond. It's paying 8%. So the conversion premium is $1,400 minus $1,200 or $200. It's selling for $200 more than the conversion value. These are not that hard, right? I told you the assignment is the easiest five points you're going to see all semester long. Now, what's the equivalent? This is a little tricky, but not really, right? It's just another conversion. Uh, this is the price at which the common stock would have to sell in order to make the convertible security worth its present price. It's also called parity, conversion parity. You take the market price of the convertible divided by the conversion rate. So wait a minute. That conversion value of that bond was 1,200, but it, the bond is selling for 1,400. So we take the 20 to one ratio, 1,400 divided by 20 or $70 a share. So the stock would need to be $70 a share to make it, you know, make sense for us to actually can uh, buy that, that convertible bond. The market price of the stock should be close to 70, but will probably be less because of the convertible securities conversion premium. That's the conversion equivalent. So here's a graph that's trying to show you what's happening with the dynamics of the price of the, the bond. So here's the stock value, and um, here are the, here's the bonds. Here's the, these are just bonds, they're not convertible bonds. So the bond, the bond value of this company is, is, is you know, bouncing along, along with interest rates. But because the stock value is quite high, the market price of the convertible will be held up above the stock value, right? Until what happens? The stock price falls below the conversion value, and then the market price of the convertible is held up because of the fact that it's a bond. Now, this is an idealized graph, isn't it? It never really, I mean, sometimes it works that way, but usually these things never really become that worthwhile <laughs> that you actually want to convert them. Because if they were, they'd be a whole lot more popular than they are now, and they're not that popular. So it reminds me of the, um, the convertible car, you know, for everyone, oh, they're so sexy, and you think about the, the hair blowing through your wind, or the wind blowing through your hair, I don't know, you're 
cruising down the road and then you, it starts raining and, and you can't get the top up because something's not working right or, or somebody put their fist through the through the car car the uh the convertible tarp or whatever it is and now it's going to cost you three thousand dollars yeah I, 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 <laughs> same thing i think it, but some people love convertibles right some people love convertible cars and some people love convertible stocks and convertible preferred i'm sorry convertible preferred stock and convertible bonds so what's the bottom line Convertible securities allow you to partake in the potential capital appreciation of the common stock with less risk because of the income from the convertible bond or the convertible preferred stock. If the stock price is below the conversion price, then the convertible securities price will be kept up because of its value from being an income-producing investment, a bond or a preferred stock. But you pay for that reduced risk via the conversion premium. Again, my personal opinion is that I believe individual retailers are best served by focusing their attention on common stocks for growth and income and focusing their attention on bonds for income. But there are always exceptions. You know, there's always going to be somebody who says, no, oh, I like these things. I do, I do, I do. But I don't. But you decide. That's why you're here, right? Maybe preferred stock speaks to you. Maybe convertible bonds speak to you. As always, we wish you the best of luck and success. We want you to be the best investors the world has ever seen. I know it's a bit over the top, but it is sincere. And that is our quick 21 minutes and 42 second <laughs> review of hybrid securities. Preferred stocks and convertible securities, convertible preferred stock, convertible bonds. Do the assignment. It's take you all of 10, 15 minutes, if that. Have the worksheet in front of you and the formulas. It's the easiest five points all semester long. Dear students, we are so, so, so uh, privileged. We feel so happy and grateful and honored that you're with us. Be awesome. You already are. <laughs>